The podcast you're about to listen to may contain random lines from musical theater, terrible attempts at original accents, and a sincere discussion about mental health. You have been warned. Are you ready to start singing with your feet? Formidable! Allez, c'est parti! Non, nous ne sommes pas fous, nous ne sommes pas ivres, nous sommes juste dans la joie. Une joie profonde, nos cœurs elles inondent. Cette joie, elle vient du ciel, non, nous ne sommes pas fous. Welcome to Sing With Your Feet. My name is Lily Fields, and I'm going to be your fairy godmother for the next half hour or so. We've been on quite the tear so far this season. We've been talking about how to stop time in its tracks, or at least how to savor each moment more intentionally so that it doesn't fly by so darn fast. Last week, we talked about how powerful a force anticipation is for getting the most out of the good things in our lives. It's a way to bring future pleasure into the present, thereby prolonging the joy that anything, and I do mean anything, can bring, independent of the actual event we're anticipating. This week, I want to talk to all the people pleasers among us. I know not all the Cinderella's out there are people pleasers, but if you found your way to my podcast, then I'm going to guess that you might just have a people pleasing streak. Now remember, I'm not a therapist. I'm not going to be able to counsel you through whatever experiences from your childhood turned you into a people pleaser. What I can do, though, is share with you a bit of my own walk down this path on my escape from people pleasing and hope that it will help you examine some of your own experiences. My goal is to help you bring more joy into your life. I was going to say by all means necessary, but honestly, the only means I really care about is the means that finds you loving, respecting, and listening to yourself more. In this week's episode, we are going to be traveling from Barbie land to the real world, but not just any real world. The real world that exists with neon glass butterflies at the base of the world's most beautiful skyscraper in Chicago, Illinois, via a basketball game at the high school gym some 30 years ago. So part one, Barbie. I have the best friends. I just want to put that out there, even though most of them will never listen to this podcast because a lot of them don't even speak any English. Yes, a few speak English. Yes, a few listen to the podcast. But this little media empire Lily Field has created over here has gone stunningly, perhaps to my Cinderella's, unnoticed by most of the people who love me. So I can gloat about having the best friends. I have the kind of friends who say things like, pick a night next week that you and your indulgent husband want to go out and I will stay with your boys. I have the kind of friends who say, I'm picking up the boys tomorrow to take them to a dino expo in Colmar or a natural history museum or to swim in a mountain lake. I have the best friends. The fact that I am willing to say yes to this kind of thing is pretty new, and it has nothing to do with being an overprotective mama bear, which my friends would all agree that no matter how much they love me, I am not an overprotective mama bear. What's new is that I have stopped people pleasing, and I have started taking people up on their offers without second guessing their intentions. I started taking people at their word instead of constantly trying to probe their words for deeply hidden meaning. And usually finding in that hidden meaning something that says, Lily Fields, you are an inconvenience to me. What's more, as I have started asking people to do things for me, as I started sharing my needs and my wants and have found that all people, not just me, like to feel like we are filling a void and being useful to others, all people like to feel like they're saving the day by making themselves available to a friend in need. Being an inconvenience has always been one of my greatest fears and asking for help felt like being an inconvenience, although I would never have felt that anyone else was being an inconvenience for asking for what they needed. The experience of asking for help and the experience of being asked for help are quite different. 
Asking for help means we're being vulnerable and expressing our needs, something many of us do not do well. And often we do not do it well because we don't even know what we need anymore. When we start to fall in love with ourselves, when we start to consider that last part of the golden rule, which is one of the variables upon which the whole predicate depends, namely, to love ourselves, we begin to exist outside of the regard of others. We start to probe our own hearts for what we need and what we want. Seeing these needs and wants fulfilled is not a selfish endeavor entirely. Many of us shuffle through life with our heads down under the weight of the expectations of others, trying to make other people's lives magical, never daring to ask for anything for ourselves. Yes, it can feel really, really good to take care of others, but it genuinely hits different when we know that we are filling our own lives with moments of joy, that we are allowing ourselves to take pleasure in the big and in the little moments that fill us up. Life feels different when doing things for others is done as we would do it for ourselves. All of that to say, I have the best friends, and one of these friends offered to stay with our boys one evening while my indulgent husband and I went and did something fun together. It was really, really hot out, and the number one thing that came to mind that sounded fun was to go sit at an air-conditioned room and empty out our brains. So we decided to go to the movies. Honestly, I don't know how I convinced him to do this, because he was, to say the very least, extremely reticent about my film selection, but he is not my indulgent husband for nothing. So we went to see Barbie. Just as a side note, I love my husband, but as we walked to the movie theater, yet another side note within a side note, remember we live in Europe, and as such, we walk to the movie theater. And not only is that perfectly normal to walk to the movie theater, there are in fact two, count them, two movie theaters within walking distance. Right, so I love my husband, but the only thing he had heard about this movie that he had chosen to retain was that there were countries in the world that had banned the movie Barbie. And he could not, he could not possibly imagine in a million years what a movie about a child's toy could contain that would cause entire swaths of the world to make what we were doing a criminal act. Right, so in retrospect, was Barbie a movie I would have been better off seeing with my sister or my best friend or even my mother? Yes, probably, although maybe not my mother. But they all live a world away, and so the man who has been putting up with me for the last 24 years put up with me once more and sat through a glorious one hour and 55 minute feminist fever dream. Oh, there was so much to behold. I mean, the dresses, the joy, the adventure, the gut punches, a few tears, lots of laughter, and a newly developed appreciation for Ken. And, as it were, Ken is our jumping off place for this week's episode. Part two, just Ken. So let's talk about Ken. First, let's talk about Ryan Gosling as Ken, shall we? I'll admit, he's probably the number one reason I wish I had been there with my best friend and not my husband because, well, it felt a little awkward wanting to enjoy the, um, the view, what with my husband sitting right there next to me, but I digress. It was like right out of the gate that the character of Ken pulled on my heartstrings, and not because of Ryan Gosling's pegs. Ken broke my heart because Ken only exists when Barbie looks at him. Ken's only desire is to be seen by Barbie so that he can exist. I mean, who doesn't want to exist, right? If a fundamental truth about ourselves is that we only exist inside the regard of others, then we are just like Ken. And what's worse and more painful is that often the fundamental truth about ourselves is that we only exist inside the regard of a certain person, and that person may or may not even know that we exist. The character of Ken, at least Ryan Gosling's Ken, only exists when stereotypical Barbie looks at him. 
She doesn't particularly have any warm feelings towards him. She manifests the same regard for him as she does for any of the Kens, or any of the other Barbies, for that matter. I guess I was distracted by the character of Ken because of just how deeply this resonated for me. I wondered how much of my life I have squandered only existing in the regard of others, believing that I had no value or worth or future or anything inherently interesting about myself, outside of what someone else could project onto me. And this is how many of us became people pleasers. We came to believe whether there is something overtly said to us or because of nonverbal signals that we have no intrinsic value. In French, there's an actual slur that is used that calls someone a vaurien, which means the person is worth nothing. It's kind of like calling someone no good, but it's far more common. Words have meaning, and our ears transmit those words to our brains, and our brains shoot them around our psyche to the places that can translate them. And likewise, the disregard of others can communicate to us unworthiness. I'm thinking of, for example, a child expressing a need and then being ignored. Children are smart. They see other people getting their needs met. When they see their own needs going unmet, but others getting theirs filled up, the feeling of unworthiness travels around their psyche too, to their heart, to their souls, and before they know it, those words or actions have paved a little bit of a path towards people-pleasing. Now, let's be honest. Good attention in the right context from the right person, it feels great. It feels amazing. Humans are great at vacuuming up the little crumbs of attention, and when we find one that is nice enough, we're going to go out searching for more. Making other people feel good is a subtle, relatively harmless form of manipulation that helps us to get more of that attention that we want. If we practice this kind of manipulation for long enough, we start to view it as transactional. I do something that will make you happy, and I will get the attention that I need. I'm being simplistic here, and this is not the only way that people-pleasing manifests. We've talked in the past about our inability to say no because we fear the reactions of others, or that another person might withdraw their friendship if we say no. All of these are legitimate issues. And as I often say, if what I'm saying here resonates with you, then you should really see a counselor or a therapist to help you comb through some of these issues. I'm gonna talk for myself here because I don't know 100% what your situation is, but I started people-pleasing very young. There are days, even now, when I wonder if any amount of anyone's attention would ever have filled me up. I think about this a lot because my youngest child, who is exactly like me in character, with the exception of the people-pleasing thing, is a bottomless attention pit, too. One day, when he's eventually in therapy, maybe he will be able to express to me what he was still missing that I couldn't give him, even though he had both of his parents' attention day in and day out without fail every single day of his life except for that one day when his parents went to go see the Barbie movie together. Maybe it's a genetic character flaw. My Gigi was like that. Remember me telling you about my smoking hot grandma Gigi? Yeah, she was like that too. Always had to be the center of attention, always had to have all the spotlights on her. I struggled with this for years and years, glomming onto relationships in which I thought I could find something to make me feel like I existed. This could have been friendships, romantic entanglements throughout school, mentorships with professors, work relationships. I really only felt like I existed if I was doing something to make that person who, for some reason or another, was my person of the moment, feel good. Startlingly, this began to shift shortly before my indulgent husband and I moved back to France. I had a job that I was surprisingly very good at. I discovered that I was capable of something that had intrinsic value. And in that, I started to have the slightest inkling that maybe I didn't need the steady flow of approval from the outside. That maybe there was something about me that had value. This was, like I said, just an inkling at first. As time passed, I started to see myself with eyes that were not those of an attention-starved child. Something, something in my brain broke and turned me into an introvert. 
I think it was part of my healing process. If I didn't spend time with anyone, I reasoned, then I wouldn't be tempted to seek out their approval. I began to regard with suspicion anyone who liked me or wanted to be around me because I assumed that they only wanted to be around me because of just how phenomenal a people pleaser I had always been. I remember distinctly one person in particular who on several occasions called me and wanted to be my friend. I was so very distrustful that I pushed her away for years. She's now one of my best friends on earth, by the way, and I did eventually come to my senses and understand that not everyone wants something from me. That inkling, that little faint idea that there is more to who I am than just who I am when somebody else directs their attention in my direction, that was where it started. I was almost 30 years old by then. Today, 16 years later, I like to think that I have mostly moved past being the complete troglodyte introvert that I had become when my brain broke, although I still do call myself a functional introvert. It's part of the process, and I wouldn't trade that process for the world. Part 3. An Illustration I want to illustrate the difference that turning away from the just Ken paradigm, in which we only exist within the scope of vision of another person, with the healthier, in love with ourselves version of ourselves. I want to illustrate the difference with two contrasting stories. The first is a snapshot from high school. The second is from my summer vacation. In a chemistry class one day during my sophomore year in high school, I gleaned from a teenage boy I was interested in that he would be at the basketball game on Friday night. That boy sat across from me, and he might have, once, asked to borrow my eraser, and might have made eye contact with me, and maybe smiled when he returned my eraser. He gave me very, very little fuel for the fire of my affection. But I suddenly cared about basketball with every fiber of my being, and I decided that even though I had no intrinsic interest in basketball, that I would attend our home basketball game that Friday night, and I would love it. So I got dressed for that basketball game, thinking about what it was going to be like to see him walking in the door. I got there early to the basketball game. I sat with some friends, one friend in particular, and I watched that door, the gymnasium door, for him to arrive. I could not enjoy anything. Not being with my friends, not the memorably exciting basketball game, or the loud, fun ambiance. I was on pins and needles, simply waiting for that teenage boy to walk in the door. My evening could not start until I knew that he was there. He did eventually show up, but he wasn't looking for me. He didn't bother to sit anywhere near me. Everything I had built my hopes on for that evening was that I might exist in the eyes of someone who, frankly, had no idea I did anything other than take incredibly detailed notes in chemistry class. The truth is, I could not have cared less about that high school basketball game. And if memory serves, there were actual reasons why this was an exciting high school basketball game, too. It was against our team's biggest rival, and for some reason, our team was on fire that night. People talked about that game against Rocky River for years. All I remember is perching there, my eyes fixed on the door, being annoyed when people would stand up to cheer because they blocked my view of the entrance. We talked about this last week, but the power of anticipation is real. There are things that anticipation can do, that articulating our hopes can do, that often make anticipation more exciting and sometimes, in this humble, very godmother's opinion, even better than the real thing. In this exact situation, on that particular Friday night, the, that thing that I had been anticipating, it's not the stuff that today I remember being the best part of that night. Like, I remember getting into my friend Stacy's red BMW and turning the heat up full blast and rolling the windows down, driving way, way, way out of our way so that we could sing along to four non-blondes while they crooned What's going on for the 762nd time? Although today, as a 46-year-old mother of two who lives a rather dull life, that right there sounds to me like the very definition of something that I'd be looking forward to. Oh, gee whiz, to have nowhere else to be, with no one looking for me, to drive those extra miles and feel the wind in my hair and not worry about gas prices? That is what I should have been looking forward to. Because those are the moments 
I enjoyed the most in retrospect. What I did by placing all of my hopes in the appearance of another person was to set myself up for disappointment. I was creating a situation in which I would be left feeling empty because all my hopes were resting in someone else. So let's move on to illustration part two. We are going to fast forward about 30 years to the end of my summer vacation this year in Chicago. This year, I managed to score an early dinner with the person I have made many a reference to on this podcast, the person I believe I always have, and I'm pretty sure I always will call the best boss in the world. He happens to be the boss who gave me the job I was doing when I started to get that inkling that I had more worth than I'd ever suspected that I could have. So he holds a pretty sacred place in my heart. So let's talk real quick about the city of Chicago, shall we? Oh, it's absolutely perfect. I actually don't know that there's much else to say on the topic, and I will entertain no other debate at this time. Everything, everything, absolutely everything about Chicago makes my heart go pitter-patter. The bridges, the river, the waterfront, the the skyscrapers. Before we arrived in Chicago, my family and I spent a few days in Michigan City, Indiana at the Indiana Dunes National Park. From the beach there on Lake Michigan, you can see the skyline of the city of Chicago, and I spent hours with the sunburn to prove it, hours staring at that skyline. I have a, a favorite skyscraper in Chicago, which sounds so stupid. It's like my kid who has a favorite kind of car. I know it's juvenile, but it's a skyscraper that just fills me with awe up close, far away, in its shadow. It's not the Willis Tower, although my eldest and I did take a safari to that mecca of skyscraperdom. No, it's the Hancock Tower. It's just... Oh. I wish I knew what it was. It's it's massive, for one thing. It's got those crisscrossy girders that make it look a little bit more dressed up compared to some of the other more plain skyscrapers. It's black, so it really stands out, not like those mirrored ones that try to blend into the skyscape. The Hancock Tower is unapologetic. It's fancy. It's ginormous. This year, in the landscaping outside of the tower on the plaza, there are dozens and dozens of large red and yellow plexiglass butterflies. They look almost luminous even in the daytime, and it's so spectacular. And when I discovered this little feature when my eldest and I were out on a walk, well, I got it into my head that I wanted to go sit there for an afternoon and read a book. What a weird thing to want, isn't it? But I had it in my head that this was very important to me. I wanted to exist in Chicago, as if it were my home, and I wanted to sit there among the butterflies and read a book. Now, one of the things about really pursuing the golden rule is that you start to become aware of these weird, offbeat kind of things that really make you happy, because you learn to ask yourself the question, what do you really want right now? So that weird flash of wanting to sit at the foot of my favorite skyscraper among the butterflies with a book, it was doable. It wasn't going to hurt anyone, and it would really, really, really make me happy. Because I had a rather early dinner appointment with my old boss, I traded little boy duty with my indulgent husband halfway through the day so that I could get cleaned up and be somewhat presentable. And once I was presentable, I had about an hour before we were to meet, and I went to my favorite tower with a book, and I sat among the butterflies reading Cyrano de Bergerac. I took a phone call from my youngest, who wanted to tell me about this afternoon that he had spent at the Maker's Lab at the Chicago Children's Museum. While we talked, I stared up at the tower. It was looming over me so tall that I felt like my feet were leaving the pavement, and I was so happy. So do you know what I did? Just to make that pleasure, that happiness linger, I asked my old boss to meet me there so we could walk to our destination together and I could spend more time at the foot of the Hancock Tower. And you know what my old boss did? He met me there because I asked him to. Elle me fait bondir Et vibrer, crier Elle me donne envie De chanter, danser Elle pousse à agir, donner, partager, et tout simplement de sourire. 
part four. Compare and contrast, shall we? So let's do this. Let's talk about that awful basketball game and the lab partner who didn't even know my name. On the one hand, I projected so much into that non-existent teenage relationship that I wasted an entirely good Friday evening on something that I didn't even really care about, ignored the parts of the evening that ended up being my favorite memories when I should have been savoring them, and now I'm filled with shame about the whole thing. On the other hand, in Chicago, I listened to my own heart and did that weird random thing that would make me feel like I existed and I savored the heck out of it. And then I respected myself and this moment that I was savoring so much that I dared to ask someone else, someone else who I highly esteem, no less, to inconvenience himself and go out of his way to make my life more pleasant. I'm telling you, Cinderella, if I can become the kind of person who sits on a plaza reading Cyrano de Bergerac among the butterflies at the foot of the Hancock Tower, after all of my past years of people pleasing, so can you. Except in relatively rare cases, like when you're in a relationship with a narcissist, or, well, I guess in our relationship with our children too, it is not other people who demand that we please them. It is our own inability to respect ourselves that demands that we please others. It is the fact that we are finding our worth in the regard of someone else. If, if we're going to be like Ken and only exist when Barbie is looking at us, then we will stay people pleasers. The paradigm shift happens when we start to fall madly in love with ourselves. It happens when we discover just how unique and wonderful and alive we are. And it will come as absolutely no surprise to you when I tell you that the easiest way to fall in love with ourselves is by living according to the golden rule. In the weeks ahead, I'm going to expose a rather controversial idea, and you're just going to have to bear with me. But this right here, the fact that falling in love with ourselves is a ticket out of the people-pleasing purgatory, that is the fruit of my controversial idea. I hope you'll join me again next week as I attempt to turn your brain into a pretzel. Listen to me, Cinderella. You exist. You exist outside of the regard of any other person. You are worthy, and there is so much about you to love. You have so much to offer, and I believe in you. I want you to start thinking about what you love, what you want, what makes your heart vibrate, and your feet leave the pavement. I want you to start finding ways to bring those little things into your everyday life because the more you have to savor, the more you will enjoy your life. You deserve this. You deserve joy and hope and little tiny things to anticipate, just like you deserve something enormous to look forward to. You deserve all these things. Now, just reach out and seize that. I don't care if it takes two weeks or 16 years for you to grasp it. Next week, we're going to start talking about looking for pleasure and joy in the tiny, tiny little details of life. Because that is how we're going to start figuring out how we can find bigger joys, longer lasting joy, and get that film of joy covering every aspect of our lives. I want to give a great big thank you to Seven Productions here in Mulhouse, France for the use of the song La Joie as the intro and outro to the show, to Matt Kugler who sang it, and Claude Equay who wrote it. This is your fairy godmother signing off. Just remember, it is never too late to start singing with your feet. <laughs>